Hello everyone. In this presentation, I'd like to talk about our research and teaching on pandemic influenza, just-in-time versus just-in-case strategies. My name is Yao Zhao. I'm a professor in supply chain management and Rutgers Business School. Let me start with an interesting fact. In the last 100 years, there are only four major pandemics happened in this world. They are the Spanish flu, the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, and COVID-19. Each killed more than 1 million people worldwide. So pandemics are rare but disastrous events. The impact of pandemic on supply chains is disastrous. As we all have experienced, significant shortages on groceries, household items, and medical supplies. Truly a supply chain nightmare. Because pandemics are rare but disastrous events, they typically generated a surprisingly large demand and panic reactions. In response to shortages, our natural reactions are panic ordering and hoarding. For example, New York City's coronavirus fatality numbers may be inflated. And even though New York, New York already had thousands of unused ventilators, the Governor Cuomo still asked for more, saying, yes, they are in the stockpile because that's where they're supposed to be, and so on and so forth. And all of these overreactions made things worse. We are risking a major supply chain breakdown, a wrong allocation of the limited resources, where some people, like those in New York, hold excessive supplies, while others are starved. Our research is motivated by the fact that these significant shortages happen not because the suppliers cannot prepare for it, but because they do not want to prepare for it. At the end, it is an incentive issue. However, we cannot blame the manufacturers and expect them to pay for the overage necessary to safeguard against a major pandemic because it's not their responsibility, but the government responsibilities. In fact, the manufacturers were already complaining. Some said, just like you cannot plan for surge capacity in an emergency room of 500 or 1,000 patients from the 20 you see in a day, you cannot have 100 million doses of vaccine supply sitting around waiting for something to happen. Some others said it's kind of odd the government will expect all these years for us to continue to throw millions of doses of vaccines away each year and never take a hit on it. Yeah, it's a rare event, right? It only happens three times or four times in 100 years. And the most funny comments is this. When manufacturers said, we are for profit, publicly traded companies. What I like to tell people is that neither Santa Claus or UNICEF is listed on NYSE. So the fundamental issue is a mismatch of interests between the manufacturers and the governments. The manufacturers are responsible for the shareholders. Their primary concern is the risk of surplus or overage because vaccines are always a cheap product with a small margin. So the manufacturers want to be conservative and use the just-in-time strategy. That is to prepare for the best scenario. However, the government's standpoint is completely different. The governments are responsible for the people, their lives, medical costs, and so on. And so their primary concern is the risk of shortage or underage. And thus, they want to be, they want to be aggressive and use the just-in-case strategy that is to prepare for the worst scenario. In summary, the companies want to make money, but the government wants to save lives. So the question is, how to align the mismatched interests? To answer this question, we first need to understand the reality of the pharmaceutical industry. Three words, profitable, risky, and risk averse. We we'll first look at profitability by comparing the pharmaceutical 
biotech, knife science industries, to the healthcare equipment and services industries. Right? The NATO provides medical device, hospitals, healthcare services, and so on. For the US S&P 500 companies, selecting the operating income in the year 2019, we found that the pharmaceutical, biotech, and life science industry is much more profitable than the healthcare equipment and services industry. Specifically, as the company's spending or total cost increases, pharmaceutical companies, the red dots in the figure, made a not higher operating income than the healthcare equipment companies, the blue dots in the graph. However, the pharmaceutical, biotech, and life science industry in the U.S. is dominated by a few large corporations. As we see on this graph, more than 40% of all the revenues in year 2019 in this industry is made by the top four companies. They are Johnson Johnson, Pfizer, Merck, and AbV, which implies that the industry is not as sustainable as we may expect because if one company runs into trouble, then we may lose a large portion of a medical supply, which happened before. Another problem of the pharmaceutical, biotech, life science industry is its high risk. In year 2019, only a small portion of these companies broke even, with the number of unprofitable companies about two times the number of profitable companies, as we can see on this graph. About 63 companies made, made some profits, and about twice as much, or almost three times as much, of companies were losing money, and a sizable pharmaceutical companies lost a ton of money. However, if we narrow down our focus, to only S&P 500 companies, the largest ones, we can see a much better average performance. Right? These are the median, gross margin, operating margin, and net margin. You can see they are all very high, much better than the healthcare equipment and services industry, which implies that these large corporations are very good at handling the risk, and they are highly risk averse. So in the pharmaceutical, biotech, and life science industry, there is but one way to align the commerce with public health, risk sharing. Here is the idea. The government provides some financial incentives to the, to the pharmaceutical manufacturers. So when they optimize their own profit, they're also optimizing the society's benefit. There are three ways to achieve this. First, cost sharing. That is, the governments share a, par share a part of the variable production cost. And the objective is to make production cheaper so the manufacturers can produce more. And second, fixed amount. So the governments commit to purchase a certain amount from the manufacturer. And so the manufacturers are risk-free. And thirdly, absorbing overage, where the government pays for all the surplus at a certain price. So that's going to make the surplus less painful to throw away. Guess which one is the prevailing practice and which one is the most effective strategy? Okay, using 2011's data, we have the following results. The fixed amount actually is the most prevailing practice, but the most effective strategy is absorbing overage. So using uh, 2011 data, we did some calculation and find out for cost sharing, if we share at 60% of the variable cost, right, the government cost, total cost will be $351 million for the manufacturers to produce up to the society optimal amount. Now, under the fixed amount strategy, the government have to buy 195 million doses at a cost of $447 million. And finally, if we use the absorbing overage strategy, the government will need to buy the surplus at about $2.10 per dose for the manufacturers to produce the uh, society optimal strategy or optimal amount. 
at a cost about $144 million. So I will not show you the mass equations here, but I'd like to show you our methodological approach. The research has two parts. First, predicting rare but disastrous events. And second, designing governmental intervention strategies. Both parts are data-driven. For the first part, we need the historical data on the pandemic events, such as Spanish flu, Hong Kong flu, and COVID. We also need population data over time, such as the healthcare, number of healthcare workers, number of elderly, and so on. And finally, we need to understand the impact factors on vaccine demand. One of that is the early versus late outbreaks. Now, this is an important factor because many people do not want to get vaccinated until they see some kind of danger, that is the outbreaks. So early outbreaks will push people to get vaccinated and thus significantly increase the demand for vaccines. Now, in designing governmental intervention strategies, we need to know the manufacturing cost structures. We need to understand the industry trend and competition intensity, that is the number of competitors. Right? We also need some mathematical models, such as news vendor and probabilities. Now, completing the research is not the end of the story. We need to empower our students by the research to make a real life impact. To this end, we wrote a, a teaching case, which is called Pandemic Influenza, so students can comprehend the research results and implement them in practice. The case proves to be timely given COVID-19. To reach students on a personal level, we also designed an online simulation, which is called Hunger Chan or Hunger Game, for students to learn panic orders hoarding and supply chain competition by experience. The simulation is fun and helps students to gain hands-on experience on the panic orders, hoarding, and supply chain competition. It proves to be much more effective than other teaching methods in both online and offline settings. One last note, the COVID-19 viruses will most likely come back each year in the future with different mutations just like influenza. So we must know how to handle them effectively. For more information about the research and teaching, you can email me or check out my LinkedIn page or blog. Thank you.